hey robot makers hope you're having a good day so far so do you want to know what projects to build with your brand new raspberry pi 5 when it arrives very soon then this is the show for you so let's dive straight in my name is kevin come with me as we build robots bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way okay let's get over to our show notes and see what today is all about so yes, this is all about learning the best projects that you can make with your new Raspberry Pi 5. Like I said, we're only a week or two away from these now being generally available. And there'll be a lot of people thinking, right, I've got this new thing. What on earth do I do with it? So this show is exactly about what you can build with it and why you want to use a Raspberry Pi 5 specifically for these projects too. So we're going to have a look at home automation. We're going to have a look at some robotics, of course. We're going to have a look at a weather station, retro gaming, a home network area storage, uh, and also some coding as well. I was thinking about maybe five projects for the Raspberry Pi 5, but then I thought, let's put some coding in there too. There's a good reason why that is. And if you're here for the uh, the live stream as well, there's some updates I can give you about the Maker Fair preparations that I've uh, been making this week. It's been absolutely crazy. And also have a bit of a Q&A after the uh, main show as well. Okay, let's get to it, shall we? So if you want to know what these, where these ideas are actually uh, housed, as it were, if you head over to kevsrobots.com slash ideas and then slash Raspberry Pi, you'll find an entire page full of Raspberry Pi featured projects that I've made that you can make too. And there's all kinds of uh, instructions on how to replicate these uh, so that you can follow along too. So you just probably need a Raspberry Pi 4 or 5 uh, to play along with some of these project ideas. There's a whole load of different projects as well. This is just Raspberry Pi. You can see what Halloween, we've got Garden, uh, I was showing in, in the uh, the break there this little Halloween project I built with a Raspberry Pi Pico and it's uh, based on uh, it can detect the distance and make a little servo move and make that funny expression so that's a very simple one for Halloween I'll just leave that going there so yes that's where you can find the ideas kevsrobots.com slash ideas slash Raspberry Pi okay so let's get to our first project then so home assistant for home automation so what is Home Assistant? It's um, some software that you can install on your Raspberry Pi uh, to do all kinds of home automation. You can bring your life, your home to life with home automation. And the cool thing about um, Home Assistant is, unlike Google uh, Home or um, Apple's HomeKit or uh, Amazon's Alexa uh, Home thing, I hope I haven't set that off now because I've got several devices in this room, um, they, they are particularly hackable. That's not <laughs> Uh, so unlike those ones you can actually hack home assistant it's kind of designed to be extended and you can do that in all kinds of different languages such as python of course c plus plus node.js and also like lua um, so that makes it really easy to develop applications on your raspberry pi or even on your main computer and then run it on the raspberry pi in the background uh, and because the raspberry pi is always on you can run this at a very low power uh, another new one is running a sort of five watts but still that's much lower power compared to like a full desktop pc or even a laptop which use uh, in the sort of tens of watts so um yeah much much uh, low power and why on it specifically on a raspberry pi 5 well home assistant now runs much much faster on the raspberry pi 5 so i had raspberry i had home assistant running on my raspberry pi 400 and when i looked at the cpu usage it was kind of a cpu hog it was taking up all the different um cpu cycles on there and that meant i couldn't run a lot of other things at the same time so uh, this is great for the Raspberry Pi 5. It means you can run this as well as other things too. In fact, you can run a whole stack of things and we'll have a look at that shortly. Uh, it also runs slightly cooler because it's got the active cooling on the Raspberry Pi 5 if you've got the fan or the official case. Um, so it won't get quite as hot uh, because it's not working full out because it's got a faster CPU. So Home Assistant is a really, really great project to use on the new Raspberry Pi 5. So let's have a bit of a dive into some of the home um, automation stuff just to give you a bit of background. So like I said, there is HomeKit from Apple. There is the Amazon the <laughs> interface um, ecosystem, I should say. And there's also the, uh, the Google Home as well. And each of these is kind of like a wall garden. They don't play nicely with each other. or Certainly they haven't done until quite recently. Uh, and we'll look at what that new um, feature is that they all have in common. That means they do now play at least a bit nicer with each other. So that thing that they all use now is called Matter and Thread. So these are two technologies. We'll have a look at these separately. So Matter is the communication standard that's used by these Internet of Things like your, your doorbell or your um, light bulbs and your heaters and fans and 
window blinds, all that kind of stuff. And this enables these smart devices to communicate uh, reliably and also securely with each other. And it doesn't matter what the manufacturer is, they can use this matter standard. And that means that we've got this compatibility between completely different manufacturers, which we didn't have before. If you bought like a light bulb, you'd look on the back and it would say works with HomeKit or um, Siri shortcuts, as well as the uh, Alexa um, uh, environment and also Google Home. So we'd have to list all the different ones separately. And hopefully that means we're now moving away from that because if it's just matter comp uh, compatible, that it works with everything. Now, Thread is actually a networking protocol. So if you have your light bulb screwed in your, your light fitting and you've got one, say, um, 20 meters away from that light uh, socket and you've got another uh, Wi-Fi enabled light bulb in there, um, that might be out of reach, that very far one, from your Wi-Fi router. However, if it can contact the other light bulb, it can create a mesh network. So you could have a whole inter-networking mesh of light bulbs that can communicate with each other again securely so that's what this protocol enables us to do so a wireless communications protocol designed to create these reliable low power and secure networks for smart devices and it forms this backbone uh, for matter enabled devices to, to allow them to work sort of seamlessly together so two technologies that work kind of hand in hand so the benefits of using these, like we said, is interoperability. We can use them um, together and we don't really have to care about uh, who makes them and what, what it traditionally would have been uh, compatible with. They're reliable, so that resilience um, is just how it makes sure that the packets of information have been sent and received securely. Um, they're secure, it means that people can't hack these. And the lower power means that the battery life of things like your doorbells or if you have a light sensor, uh, that can also use um, uh, very, very low power. Um, so they work together um, just by creating this unified, reliable ecosystem and things like the smart lights, thermostats, locks all work together seamlessly. I should call it something like seamless instead of matter. A thread makes sense, but matter, not sure what that's uh, all about really. So that's the, the main benefits of that. So there's a couple of other technologies as well. Um, I've looked at all of these, I would say. Um, Node-RED, um, I use that as part of my home automation system it's a really nice node js based um, automation system it's very very easy it's a nice interface with all these little noodles that you sort of plug together and you can create um, interesting flows as it calls it um, interesting shortcuts and automations home assistant is a general nice interface for setting up all your home automation devices seeing them controlling them there's nice dashboard views and there's also a uh, an app that you can use from your mobile phone. So that means you can use this when you're out and about, not connected to your home network um, or not on your home LAN. And then you can obviously control this through the app from anywhere. So you can turn that uh, thermostat up or whatever uh, on the, before you get home. And then OpenHab is uh, just another um, home automation system as well. But I think Home Assistant is the one that's the, the leader. And that's one I would recommend to run on the Raspberry Pi 5. Of course, it's open source and it's free. That's another cool reason to use this. And it, and it works with over 1900 devices. So that's like a lot of different devices. The IKEA ones, I think are particularly good value for money. I recently bought some of these for the robot lab. So I've got this little um, on off switch here. If I uh, press this, if I move my head out of the way, I think you can see behind me, those two lights will go off and then come back on again, just by me pressing this on and off. So there we go. So they're just using the IKEA trad free how you pronounce it and you can extend it there's all kinds of add-ons there's an entire ecosystem of add-ons that you can install download um, there's companion mobile apps there's lots of different powerful automations works with mqtt so that's really great it means you can plug it into things like node-red and all your smart home data stays local so that's one of the main reasons why you don't use this instead of like the uh, the big three commercial ones that are out there because you have your data still within your house and you can do all this energy management too so works with everything uh, plays great so I think it's a uh, time to use that on a Raspberry Pi 5 now one of the great things is you can actually install this using docker so if you want to keep your Raspberry Pi's file system nice and clean and um, things seg segmented you can run this in a container using docker so I've put a, a link to how to get that installed up on the screen there if you go to github.com slash Kevin McAleer slash clustered pi then you can uh, get the script from there 
Uh, now, if you want to create your own home automation devices, like say you've got a vivarium with some geckos in there and you want to turn the heater on and off or the lights on and off and a schedule, you can actually get one of these home automation hats. So Pimbaruni do a great one, which is the home automation hat mini. And you've got a whole bunch of different uh, inputs and outputs on there. You've got things like the normally open, normal closed terminals that can do 24 volts, at two amps. These like relays for doing that. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other things on there as well. But basically, it's a very great one. I did an entire show on this one. So if you want more information about that, just go and check the uh, the ideas page and you'll find this one too. So a bit more information about that particular hat there. Uh, one of the great things about this one is it has a nice little screen on it. So you can actually make um, you know a status display of uh, what the current state of all these different things are. Uh, and they do a slightly larger version that's got more... Um, uh, relays on it as well I believe which isn't the mini version so check that out they also do a Pico powered version as well so the home automation um, I think it's the 2040W check that one out too so that's a uh, project number one so project number two is all about robotics building your own robot so I was sent a while back um, a robot called Rover from VM. These retail about $99, which is like super cheap for a robot. It's really, really well built. So it's got a couple of uh, DC motors in for uh, moving the robot backwards and forwards, left and right. Uh, it's got a little caster on the back. It also has a camera, like a webcam with a microphone on front so it can detect things. And this can be powered by a Raspberry Pi 5 as well. So one of the reasons I would say you would want to build a robot as a project with a Raspberry Pi 5 is you get all that joy of programming and having something work, but in the physical world. So seeing something physically move um, in, in uh, reaction to your code and the inputs is just the best. Combine that with like a bit of 3D printing. If you've got a 3D printer and you can build a robot, it's just heaven. So why the Raspberry Pi 5 for this? Well, now you can have two cameras. You can have dual cameras, not just web cameras, but the actual built-in uh, using a little uh, DSi connector. You can have two cameras and you can do things like stereoscopic vision with your robot to detect things uh, in a 3D environment. So really, really cool. And obviously it can run ROS and it can run ROS much quicker than the Raspberry Pi 4 as well. So you'll have a lot less problems. Uh, one of the reasons I sort of paused my development of ROS on the Raspberry Pi was because the LiDAR uh, was taking in so many sensor readings, it couldn't actually uh, manage them on the Raspberry Pi. It was kind of overwhelmed. So um, this is going to be great on the Raspberry Pi uh, 5, particularly with the 8 gig of RAM. And the faster USB um, on them on the Pi 5 means it's got faster external storage, so it'll work with peripherals as well better. So cameras with a high quality uh, uh, um, resolution on there will work much better too. So there's lots of different robot manufacturers out there. Um, you can get all kinds of kits and you can also build your own. I've got a whole, this is what this entire channel is all basically about. So check out the ideas page for robots and you'll find some robots that you can build with Raspberry Pis on there too. So talking about robots, uh, we have a guest with us on the, uh, the show today in the chat, which is uh, Danny Stable who wrote this book, which is uh, Robotics at Home with Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, it's a fantastic book it's designed how you can it's designed for people who want to build robots in their own home uh, and kind of on a budget as well how can you do that with a raspberry pi pico which is what, three three to six dollars worth of a, a microcontroller and how can you build um all the the you know movement in there the sensors and he talks you through all the code step by step and even gives you like a, a plan design of uh, a robot that you can actually build gives you all the different measurements and so on so it's a really really great book now one of the really cool things is Danny's giving away two copies of this book um, to people who are watching this show so uh, so Danny have you got a question for us to actually ask the audience I don't know if he's uh, asked you that yet Alex uh, but yeah we want a question from Danny to, for the audience and they simply just need to reply with what the answer is and then um, um, if they have a, a username on uh, YouTube uh, they just need to be able to provide that with the answer um, so that we can scrape that off at the end of the show before I get rid of all the comments. Um, and obviously, if people are watching this on replay as well, it'll be open to people for at least two weeks. So I'm away in Rome next Sunday. And then the week after that, it's, uh, it's Halloween, I think, on the... Uh, it's the Halloween weekend and we're away for that sort of half term. So it'll be at least two weeks before we pick a winner. But we'll, we'll announce that on the, the next show that we have. Um, the two lucky people to get one of these amazing books and it's a it's a good read um, I've been reading through this I like the level that it's at I like all the different explanations of code and so on um, so yeah you, you definitely want to get a copy of this even if you're not a winner so as a, have we got a question yet on there no. not yet I'll, I'll give another couple of minutes and then if not we'll come up with one um, there we go so 
So Danny says, uh, hey, Dan let me put it up on the screen, actually. There we go. Let me uh, bring it up on the screen. I'm just looking on my other machine there. So Danny says, uh, hey, Danny here. What's your greatest Raspberry Pi Halloween make idea? So what's your favourite greatest make? Um, so if you put your, your answer in the comments and obviously your name will be associated with that. That means that the, the publishers can reach out to you, get your details for shipping and all that kind of stuff when we actually pick the lucky winners. So fill your boots with that one. Uh, let us know. It has to be in the comments after the video because it yeah, needs to be. That's fine. So yeah, Alex was just saying we can comment this after the video, but um, we can also just capture the uh, the comments from here as well, Alex. It's, that's not a problem. So people are watching this live, you can also comment what your favourite Raspberry Pi Halloween make idea is. So just one more time. What are your greatest Raspberry Pi Halloween make ideas? So mine would obviously be my little skeleton, spooky, scary skeleton, which is Pico powered as well. Oh, I've won a book. <laughs> so there we go. Okay, moving on to our next, um, well, before I do that, let's just have a quick read through what this says here. So Robotics at Home with Raspberry Pi Pico is an introduction to building robots with a Pico at its core using CircuitPython. So along the way, you'll learn programming skills, computer-aided design, soldering, making a robot chassis, and, um, and all about robot sensors and devices, and robot algorithms such as PID, PID, and Monte Carlo localization, which is super cool if you can get your head around it. Uh, but Danny really explains it well in the book. So you can connect your robot with Bluetooth to your smartphone and computer. And by the end of the book, you'll have a robot platform ready to expand uh, and inspiration uh, plus skills to take on more robotics projects. So really, really cool book. Thanks for that, Danny. I'll uh, move on to our next, our next project. Oh, before we do that, if you like this video and you want to help me grow my YouTube channel a little bit more, drop me a like. They're absolutely free. They mean a lot to me when I see uh, that people have liked these particular videos. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, really consider doing that. It really does help me grow. Uh, and it means a lot to me personally if you do that. Um, it's just one of those small metrics uh, that just tells me that I'm going in the right direction and so on. And obviously drop a comment about what your favorite Raspberry Pi make, uh, Halloween make is as well. Cool. I do go live every single Sunday at seven o'clock. Um, I think this is the last one that will be British summertime. So when we come back on the next show, it'll be uh, GMT. Uh, but yeah, seven o'clock UK local time every single week, apart from next week and the week after. So the next project is a weather station. So measuring your environment. This is one I absolutely love. So why do you want to do this in general? So you can record your current environmental conditions. You can participate in citizen uh, data science as well, which is pretty cool, like what the precipitation rate is, what the wind speed is, um, even things like earthquake. There's all kinds of sensors that you can get. Uh, there's a couple of cheap sensors you can get. Let me grab one of these. I got this one from IKEA, which is a little, it's actually switched off at the moment because I've just unplugged it, but it will tell you what the current um, particulate level is in the environment you're in uh, as a value. And that means, you know, are there particulates in the air that are harmful to you? So if you get like a red light on here, you know that you need to clear the air or do something about that. Now that's great for in the moment. But what if you want to know what the whether there was a spike in the middle of the night, for example, you might have had the window open, you didn't know this, and you're wondering why you woke up with a cold or something like that, or cough. It might have been because there was like a high particulate level uh, and you didn't know where it was. So by having a weather station, you can detect and record all these um, sensor readings and then you can graph them, which is just one of the most beautiful things you can do. So why would you want to do this with a Raspberry Pi 5 is that you can run the hats, the sensors, the data collection on the dashboard, all on a single um, single board computer. So I've got this running on about three or four different Raspberry Pis just to kind of spread the workload around. So I have one that runs Grafana, which does all the dashboards. I have one that does InfluxDB, which is the time series database. We'll have a look at these in a minute. And also Node-RED, I have another one running Node-RED, which does all the uh, integration with things like MQTT and so on. So what I can do very simply with this weather station, I got this one from Pimeroni. Um, I can re record the wind speed. I can record, <laughs> doing this as if you don't know what that means. Uh, we can measure the wind direction. 
we can measure the water level or the amount of rain, the precipitation, uh, the temperature, the humidity, the air pressure, and as well as the particulate level too. So we can see if there's any toxic particle levels. So if there's like a grass fire, I can see that sort of climb and then go back down. And you can also integrate other sensors that you might have around your house that maybe you built yourself uh, using one of these weather stations. So it's really, really great for doing this. So you can also get this weather hat, which can help integrate to one of those weather kits. So this particular one from Pimroni, once again, has a color screen. It has two uh, RJ11, like the old, it's like a phone socket connector in there, um, which means you can plug in the rain sensor and the, um, the uh, air speed and direction sensor. It has a light level sensor. It's got the barometer, the pressure, temperature, humidity sensors. And it's also got those four buttons for sort of navigating the screen. You can create your own user interface with that. So it's really, really cool. And that's called the weather hat from Pimroni. Works with all the Raspberry Pis. Just pushes onto the top of the Raspberry Pi using the 40 pin header. <clears throat> and software wise, they've created some really great software for this with all kinds of examples. So if you go to github.com slash Pimroni slash weather hat dash Python, you can grab their Python library and actually start making your own um, code from this. Um, so maybe you want to send it in a specific place or save it locally or whatever you want to do. You can really customize that code as well. So it's very, very easy to use and open source. It's pretty cool. So I developed some additional code for this. So it grabs all these sensor readings and then it will broadcast it um, on the weather hat topic um, to my local MQTT server, which is running on the Raspberry Pi 400, I believe. Um, so you can grab this code. This one's at github.com slash kevinmacalier slash weatherhat underscore two underscore MQTT. I was having a conversation uh, last week with the inventor of MQTT, which was quite bizarre. I didn't realise these people still existed and were still about to uh, speak to, but he was a really nice guy, actually. So that was a fun conversation. He was correcting some of the things that I'd, I previously thought I knew about that. So this is how my particular software stack works. So I've got the weather hat that's running a Python script, which is the one I've just uh, shown you the link to. So that grab all the sensor data. It will then send that to the MQTT broker. I then have a node red um, instance running on a Raspberry Pi that can then listen on that particular weather topic, take all those readings and then put them to a, send them to an influx DB, which is an influx database. An influx will store those readings um, at the time that they were recorded. So it stores them in time order, and that makes it really, really easy to quickly get graphs of all that data and uh, look at a particular time window or expand or contract it because it's ordered by time. And then Grafana is a visualization software. It does all kinds of graphs and dashboards. Really, really neat for doing that. Again, each one of these is completely free, open source, and play very nicely with each other. So if you want to learn how to do that, I did do an entire video on weather stations um, and the Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is the, the final bit of that particular puzzle, which was the node red flow. So you can see they've got the weather hat data coming from the MQTT server. I convert that data uh, into JSON, which is this JavaScript object notation format. We can then add a location to that particular Java uh, object. So I can say this is the summer house data. I can then tag it and say um, it's the summer house, it's um, the weather hat. And then I can then send that to the influx database, which can then add those tags to it to, to make it really easy to do dashboards and so on. So really, really cool. And then that's the content of the uh, the actual node. You can see that it just gets the payload, which is the all that data of sensor readings. It creates a new um, array, which is just the location is called Summerhouse. And then it essentially just sends that array one and array two uh, off to the influx database. So really, really nice and simple. I love the visual uh, look of that. So InfluxDB, just in case you're not aware of this, is this time series database from the Influx Data Company written in Go, which is an interesting quirk of it, which is the Google language. Um, and um, it's designed for application metrics, Internet of Things, center data, anything that's real time analytics. And it also has this uh, data format that's our database called Graphite as well. But um, I've not been using that particular one. I, I think I'm just using the standard database. And then I use Grafana to visualize that. So Grafana is uh, for doing charts, uh, graphs, and alerts, which is pretty cool. So if you had, um, you were wanted a particular, say you had like a child's room and you wanted to make sure it was above a particular temperature, you could have an alert that if it drops below that, you get a notification on your phone or a light goes red or there's a buzzer or whatever. You can do all that kind of stuff uh, with the alert system. 
and it means that you can create really um, complicated or sophisticated rather than complicated monitoring dashboards using some interactive queries really really cool really easy to uh, to set up so i did a show about how to do that and if you want to grab the scripts for all this they're all on the clustered pi i did an ansible install script for this so you can basically just send this to your raspberry pi 5 um, so you can grab those from github.com slash slash clustered pi so uh, um, these are all the links are in that particular clustered pi link Okay, so project number, what are we on now? Three, is it? This is retro gaming. So you can relive those past adventures. So why do you want to do this? So it's portable and it's affordable. So you can make really, really cool games devices. Uh, I created one I'll show you in a second, which is the Atari 2600 case using, it was actually a Raspberry Pi um, compute module that I created this for, but you could actually put a Raspberry Pi 5 in there as well. There's a huge community support for this particular platform, which means that we can um, we can have all kinds of um, emulators and ROMs and any problems that people may have come across have been solved in that community. So really, really cool. There's a growing community around that. And you can relive your childhood memories uh, from that digital age. So I love things like ZX Spectrum games, uh, Game Boy games, uh, the uh, Sega Mega Drive or Genesis, I think it was in the US. Uh, absolutely love that kind of stuff. And you can bring uh, additional hardware to this. You can bring hardware joysticks. You can even build it into an arcade cabinet to enhance your experience. So why Pi 5? Because you could do this before for, from quite a few um, generations ago. Well, the emulation is now even faster. And that means that new platforms are now even possible. So I understand that the PlayStation 2 is now um, quite um, feasible on the Raspberry Pi 5. And it's also really, really easy to set up a Raspberry Pi uh, to run with RetroPie. And I'll show you how to do that. Uh, we did a show on this not so long ago. So what is RetroPie? So it's software that runs on your Raspberry Pi to turn it into a retro gaming machine. And you can save games. Um, you can save and load them. You can save states of games and so on. And there's a whole load of systems that it supports. Let me just show you just how many systems are supported on RetroPie. It's insane. So I'll just pick out a few of those, like I said, the, the Atari 2600, the Amiga, the Atari ST. We've got the GameCube on there, the Game Boy Advance, the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, the Sega Mega Drive slash Genesis, even the old traditional Macintosh classic. We've got the uh, uh, MAME on there as well. We've got Master Systems, um, Nintendo 64s, PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, ZX Spectrum. Uh, we've got the Wii on there as well, Virtual Boy, the... Uh, NES and SNES are on there too. All those different systems. It's, it's insane how many systems there are that are supported. So there are some legal considerations to consider. You should um, own the original game to avoid any kind of piracy claims from um, that may uh, come about. And you can pick these up pretty cheaply on eBay. So that's not really a big issue. And you do need to get your ROMs from a legitimate source. So purchasing and recognize, uh, from recognized platforms using open source games. So sort of recommended. Uh, and loading them, you can load them a couple of different ways. You can either use a USB, you can do network file transfer or direct downloads. So the network file transfer is probably the easiest way. And to do that, you'll need to set up Samba, which is the uh, the networking standard for um, Macintoshes and uh, Windows and, and a bit of Linux on there as well. So I'll show you how to do that too. So we can load them a couple of ways. Like I said, we can either download them directly onto the Raspberry Pi or just copy them across network or direct downloads, and we can do this Samba file sharing as well. Um, now there is some specialized hardware you can get for this, which is really cool. We can, Pimeroni have got a whole range of retro gaming hardware. They've got the Picade console, which is that smaller one, and they've got the Picade desktop, which is absolutely beautiful. Uh, so you can go to shop.pimroni.com slash product slash Picade to check that one out. I think they just now sell the 10 inch version, which is the nice, large screen if you're getting one of these as well just drop kevin at the uh, as the code at checkout and i'll thank you later for that it helps me i get a tiny bit of kickback for that so uh, it doesn't cost you anything to do that so the way that this works in the background underneath all that beautiful um, um, cabinets that they've created there's this picade x hat that they have for the raspberry pi so it's got a couple of dupont connectors for connecting to the buttons that are on the case and the joystick and they're all push fit speaker terminals as well. So you can very easily just put in the speaker wires. Uh, no soldering required there. Um, it's got a nice three watt, which is more than loud enough uh, speaker on there. Has USB-C power management. So it's got a really nice soft button to turn the uh, the uh, cave machine on and off. 
It's got the four-way joystick inputs, six player buttons, four utility buttons in them as well as that. And it's got all these metal standoffs as well so it can sit and stand on your Raspberry Pi securely. So you only want to check that out if you're building your own arcade machine. They've done all that hard work for you. So this is the Atari 2600 case I was talking about. It's designed for the Compute Module 4. I'll see if I can modify this for you for the Raspberry Pi 5 as well. Uh, but it's a really easy uh, 3D print to make. It's just a couple of pieces. You can see there are three different pieces. The base, the top, and then the front piece, which you can put a nice bit of wood panelling on. I've got some wood vinyl tape. Uh, so if you want to check that one out, go to kevsrobots.com slash blog slash Atari-2600 to see that particular project there. So adding games is pretty simple to do. So there's loads of different websites out there. Again, just make sure you're not stealing this, that you're um, downloading games that you actually own already. Um, and you can basically just emulate one of these memory modules within the original cartridge. That's what the file will essentially be. So to do this, you need a Raspberry Pi 5 or 4, potentially. The 5 is obviously going to run this much better. You need a computer with a card reader. Uh, you need the Raspberry Pi imager to just download RetroPie. You can download that directly onto a uh, memory card. You need the SD card itself, obviously. If you have the higher speed memory card as well, then you will get an extra two times speed boost from the Raspberry Pi 5 as well. And you can use some USB or wireless game controller as well. It works with all the Bluetooth controllers. So setting it up is pretty straightforward. You can, like I said, download it directly onto the um, uh, from RetroPie.org.uk onto your memory card. Or if you want to do it from within the Raspberry Pi that um, you already have set up, you can just do those commands that are on screen there as well. So just pause that screen if you want to grab what those particular commands are there. OK. And then to actually start the emulation, you simply just type in emulation station. That's the software that runs all the different emulators. Very, very simple. And then that'll boot up full screen uh, and you'll be away with the uh, retro gaming peoples. To exit a game, you simply do start and select it together at the same time, uh, and then you'll just be returned to the main menu. So it's quite straightforward to exit out, even if you haven't got a keyboard or mouse attached to your, your cabinet. And to set up the ROMs, you can use Samba. So remember when I was saying about Samba, it was the easiest way to do file transfer. So I've, I've created um, a how-to guide for this. If you go to kesrobots.com slash blog slash setting up dash uh, Samba dash for dash RetroPie. You'll find all you need there for the, uh, how to get started with Samba. So Samba is a really great way for setting up file transfers. And one of the reasons you might want to do that is the next project. So we'll have a look at the next project just after this slide that I forgot was in there. This is just about how to add Bluetooth controllers. So again, if you wanted to know how to do that, you can just pause the screen and uh, follow those instructions there. But it's pretty straightforward to do that. OK, so this next project you want to, might want to consider is setting up a home network area storage or NAS uh, device. And you can store all your home data at home securely without ever going out onto the cloud. So if you're super sensitive about privacy, this is maybe a solution for you. So Raspberry Pi 4 there as well to start of interest. So why would you want to do this? So it's much cheaper than buying a, a Drobo or some kind of external storage device uh, that's a purpose-built NAS. They can be pretty pricey. Um, it's fun and easy to do as a project. It's really fun actually to do this when you actually see that your files are available all the time because you can leave this running and it uses very, very little power. Uh, one of the reasons you might want to consider doing this specifically with a Raspberry Pi 5 is that the USB is now so much faster. You get five gigabits per uh, USB um, port on there. Uh, through the two USB 3 connectors and you've also got them other USB 2 connectors on there. So this now means you can hang a number of different drives off the back of the Raspberry Pi uh, and raid together those um, um, those drives into a much bigger drive or just have some redundancy. So if one drive fails, you've still got the other one going there. So you can do all that kind of raid configuration uh, within the Raspberry Pi uh, and then make that available to things like RetroPie to store your games on or just create a Samba network share that you can access from any device on your network and just your network. So we've also got the PCIe hat for M.2 MVE storage. That means we can have all that faster storage actually within the device as well or we can have them externally connected uh, via the USB 3. Like I said it's very low power 
So even with the drives connected, um, you can basically just use that 5 watt power supply. You probably won't be using the full 5 watts on that because uh, these drives are quite low power. And they can either be the spinning disks or the um, solid state disks as well. Obviously, solid state is going to be much quicker than the spinning disks. And it's really easy to set up Samba. I had the link on the previous page. And if you want to know how to build one of these, there's a really great article that Rob wrote for Magpie magazine. So you can see the link there, magpie.raspberrypi.com slash articles slash build dash r dash raspberrypi dash pi dash nas <laughs> to get to that. So definitely check that one out. So why do you want to build this with the Raspberry Pi 5? So a couple of different reasons why you want to build a NAS. So it's cost effective solution. You're not paying that uh, commercial kind of prices for something that's essentially quite cheap. If you look at the price of external drives on say Amazon or whatever your preferred um, hardware provider might be, say scan.co.uk for example, and then you look at the price of drives from um, uh, one of these Drobo or Synology, QNAP, that kind of thing, they're pretty expensive. You can build your own version of that quite simply. You can even get the, the uh, enclosures to put all this in as well if you wish. And you can tailor it to your specific needs. So if you don't need loads of fast storage, maybe you just want lots of um, large but slow storage for backing stuff up, you can do that. Um, so I've got my own NAS solution under here that I'll be definitely moving to Raspberry Pi uh, once I get um, the Raspberry Pi 5 M.2 hat as well. It's energy efficient, so the Raspberry Pi consumes very little power, and that means you can just leave it on all the time. Um, it can even do like sleep states and so on and wake up on land. There's all kinds of clever stuff like that that you'd be able to do. I'm not sure you can do that um, at launch on um, Bookworm, but I know that's something that's uh, definitely capable on the Raspberry Pi 5. Yeah, and you can run it, like I said, 24-7 without really impacting your electricity bills. So NAS stands for Network Attached Storage. You'll sometimes see if you work in... Um, IT SAN as well, and that's a storage attached, uh, attached network, which is kind of a different approach uh, to um, network attached storage. So it's a device or server that provides centralized storage um, accessible over a network. It's cost effective solution, so it doesn't cost us very much to build this, and we can repurpose existing pies or your nice new one at a fraction of the price uh, of these commercial ones. We can extend it, it's energy efficient, it's really something that you want to, uh, to look at. It's quiet as well, compact, so you're not taking up a lot of space. You can tinker with it, you can learn how all the different, um, you know, play about with security, make things really secure. There's all kinds of different things that you can learn from this, and it's ideal for things like media streaming. So if you want to create your own, like, Kevflix instead of Netflix, you can put all your own personal media on there, and you know that it's safe and secure, and only be accessible from uh, within your network. And you can also build that data redundancy and backup by using what they call RAID, a redundant array of inexpensive disks. Uh, so you can do that uh, just using standard Raspberry Pi OS. And you can safeguard all those important files from hardware failures too. So definitely a project that you want to consider. You can also add remote access and file share. So you can you could set this up as an SFTP server, secure file transfer protocol. Um, you could make it uh, accessible by a VPN. So you would host a VPN at your house and you could connect to it from, say, uh, you know, an airport terminal or from a hotel abroad or something and get access to your own content. And uh, Raspberry Pi supports various different NAS software like Open Media Vault, Free NAS and so on. So you can choose whatever uh, suits your skill level. And it's scalable. You can add more drives as you need to simply by just plugging it into the USB connectors or the M.2 hat as that becomes available. So finally, we have code. So one of the really cool things about the new Raspberry Pi 5 is it runs Visual Studio like an absolute dream. Now, we've, it's a bit of a book heavy episode today. There's another book I wanted to sort of call out, which is Simon Monk's uh, coding book. So this is the 21st century's most valuable skill. So he's got a really nice book on here um, showing you more Python. Uh, you can learn how to basically program in Python. It's quite a, a quick read this one. So I highly recommend that from uh, Simon Monk. And you can actually learn any language. It doesn't have to be Python. Programming is the 21st century's most valuable skill. And even with AI, this just uh, accelerates that uh, need to have uh, learning on there. So he can help you get up to speed very, very quickly. And why the Pi 5? Well, like I said, Visual Studio Code runs like an absolute dream. It feels just like running it on a Windows or uh, a Mac um, or a full-blown desktop computer when you run this on a Raspberry Pi 5. It opens very, very quickly, and you've got all those plugins and linting and all that kind of cool stuff. 
works really, really, really well. It's perfect for running scripts at a low power compared to a laptop or desktop server. So you can write your own little script that does something, maybe it like tweets out a message or something every hour, or there's all this, honestly, there's infinite kind of ideas that you can have there for programming. And running it on a Raspberry Pi, which is very low power, means that you've got all that kind of stuff working for you all the time. Um, so if you want to learn more programming today, you can do that. I've got a couple of free courses on uh, how to get started with robotics, how to get started with MicroPython particularly, uh, and also Python uh, 101. So if you go to kezrobots.com slash learn slash, you'll find all the free courses there. No sign up required, just get straight into the learning completely for free. Okay, we do have merch. We have this uh, beautiful hat I'm wearing here. I have a red version just under here if I can grab this without destroying everything. This nice red version. I know this is a bit controversial in the US at the moment. I bought this before like, Mr. Trump started using these uh, red hats for his MAGA stuff. Uh, I just like the color red, but um, that's why I'm wearing my black hat now so I don't get all the hate that I got from people who are very anti-Trump. Um, so yes, you can get those, you can get the mugs, you can get the notebooks, the jackets and so on. And once I've got the uh, Robot Makers Almanac ready, I'll publish that on there too. And you can fill your boots with that. Now, if you've not joined our Discord server, you definitely want to check that out. Uh, it's completely free to sign up for this. And you've got a whole community of people. There's about three or four hundred people on there now. So it's a real growing community. And you can post screenshots of things. So if you, there's a piece of code I've written years ago and you want to know why doesn't that work anymore, hit me up in there, just at me and then... Uh, I'll answer that. It's much better than, uh, say, Twitter or uh, the comments in YouTube, for example, or on Instagram, which sometimes get questions. Best going to Discord and other people can help as well because I'm not always on there. And if you want to follow me on social media, I am all over social media. So I'm at threads.net, uh, Kevin McAleer at threads.net. I'm on TikTok, Kevin McAleer 6. And have asked TikTok to get me the streaming key as well via a Carter Pulse, hopefully. Fingers crossed they'll see that and uh, uh, see that I've been streaming for hundreds of hours already on YouTube and therefore will help me get uh, streaming on TikTok as well. I'm on Instagram at Kevin McAleer, uh, on Twitter slash X at Kev's Mac, and Mastodon Social at Kev's Mac at Mastodon Social, and also on Blue Sky at, uh, at Kev's Mac at bluesky.net, whatever it is, dot app as well on there. So you can find me all over the place. And what else have we got on here? Why is that paused? <laughs> and then if you want to help me, uh, you want to join me and support me, then you can get your name in the end credits. Simply go into kezrobots.com slash coffee and uh, you can buy me a physical coffee. I absolutely love coffee. Uh, you can go to um, either the button below the main player on YouTube and do a super thanks. There's like a thanks button there. There is a join button if you want to join our YouTube membership program, which quite a few people have. And if you're live now, you can also do a super chat. I shall just make sure those uh, are all enabled as well. Not seeing our stream elements friend come on yet. I don't know if that came on before. Um, but yes, there's all the different routes that you can do that. Let me just click on there. And if you are already a supporter, I'll give you a bit of a shout out now because uh, you people have really been helping me support the channel. Uh, so I can get all the things I need to make these projects and do events as well, such as the Maker Fair Rome. So we have um, some supporters I want to call out. We've got Mary Louise Mayer. We've got Paul Hallam. We have uh, some members on the Buy Me A Coffee membership. We've got Jeff. We've got Adam. We've got um, DN Corti. We've got Marlene, Brent, Tom, Shemi and Steve Phillips. We have uh, on the YouTube side, we've got Chris, we've got Cassie, we have Dale, Tinkering Rocks, JDM, Johnny Bates, Bill Hoy, Oxford39, we've got Hans from Cheerlights, we have Michael and we have, of course, Tom as well. So thank you so much for supporting the show. Okay, so it's at this point in the video, if you're watching this on replay, I'll say thank you so much for watching and I shall see you next time.